Well, welcome back to Watchbox Reviews and Watches Live 32. We have a fantastic array of watches on the table, but I should note, you can't see the one that I'm going to give to you. You'll have to check the description field below this video as we are giving away a Breitling Colt Sky Racer, 45 millimeter bright light case, COSC quartz chronometer, and a wonderfully useful unidirectional dive bezel, my personal favorite chronograph for those of you who watch the reviews. Welcome everyone who's joining us from around the world. I can see Eddie Landsberg first in Mark Lisenby, Edward Ledden of Sweden, Russell 996 and Simon Holt joining us from Hollywood, Northern Ireland. All right, pilot style, welcome aboard guys. Let's start it off with a grand complication, shall we? How about a minute repeater? How about a perpetual calendar? How about both? Let's go with the Patek Philippe. I'll show you what you're getting. 5213G is a model that came out in 2013, the successor to a tonneau cased predecessor. This is a retrograde perpetual calendar moon phase with a glorious repeater and a hunter case back, one thing at a time. First, let's fire off the repeater. For those who might be joining for the first time and haven't heard a minute repeater or maybe don't know what the complication is, it is a late renaissance evolution that grew out of the need to be able to hear a watch when there was not artificial light. So the repeating watch, a miniaturization of repeating clock towers and then repeating clocks, to this day, the one complication that really can't be industrialized and hasn't been. Let's see if I set that just perfect. Okay, so what you just heard, the hours, so 12, three double strikes, three quarters, and then if I said it correctly, it should have been 14 chimes for 14 minutes after the three quarters. So basically, that should have been 12.59. Now you can see the watch in white gold, 40 millimeters, a contemporary size, but when you turn it over, that's really the business end. The R27, QR, a wonderful repeating caliber, micro rotor automatic, gyro max balance. You can see that you do get what you pay for. Some folks take exception to the fact that paddock movements don't hack. Trust me, here you won't miss it. And that's what's behind this extraordinary opaline satin metallic facade. All right, so I kind of opened with my heavy hitter. We'll come back to it at the end. Those just joining us, don't worry, you haven't missed out. All right, question from AC4. How much bigger are the Grand Reverso compared to the current Reversos? Well, the original XGT case is actually not as big as you think. It is about 29 millimeters wide. It's about 46 and a half millimeters lug to lug. Uh, the Reverso 976 and 986 are much bigger. But let me show you the ultimate Reverso on the table tonight. This is a watch that sells for 24 new and about 15 pre-owned. Probably the star of the SIHH 2016 Reversos. So this watch right here for the 85th anniversary combined an oversized case at 49 millimeters lug to lug, 30 millimeters wide, granular dial with applied rose gold indices and Dauphine hands. It has a day, it has a date, it has a month, it has a moon phase, and when you flip the case, it has a GMT second time zone and a gorgeous sunray basic chassis underneath. So we changed from the Prolage to the Sunray chassis in 2016, but there's another innovation worth noting, which is that previous Reverso Duo actuators, which were case side pusher adjusters or dimple adjusters, dispensed here for a slider that's built into the case, completely cloaked when the case is closed, and easily accessible without a special tool or a pusher. You don't have to fidget with a toothpick to set your second time zone on this Reverso Tribute calendar. Calendar, moon phase, and dual time all in one. This is the biggest current Reverso that is not a grand complication of some kind.
and absolutely gorgeous. If you're going to buy it, pre-owned is the way to go again. 24 new, about 15 pre-owned. That's the way I would buy it. Another feature that changed on reversos of 2016, the case back got a little bit of profiling, so it now has a bit of a Franck Muller arc to it, a camber from side to side, rather than being flat as a board, so these modern big reversos actually wear more easily than their 2000s predecessors. Okay. So guys, those just joining us, don't miss out. We're giving away a Breitling Colt Sky Racer, a $2,000 retail value. The link to the contest is in the description of the video. So give yourself every chance to win. A summer fun watch, featherweight, effortless, set it and forget it, quartz chronometer precision, Breitling Colt Sky Racer, bright light case, we're giving it away. Bump, 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 bump. Okay. Varga... Dainez asking, Tim, is there any mechanical countdown timer with alarm in existence? Yes, and we have one. The Glossuta Original Pano Retrograph. It is a 2000 flyback programmable countdown chronograph with a chiming function. You can choose the countdown between 30 and one minute, and it will count backwards, and when it reaches the end of its set time, it will chime. So that would probably be your best bet. Otherwise, you're gonna wind up getting yourself an alarm watch and just trying to set a time that's X number of minutes from your current time in order to act as an effective countdown. But the Glossuta Original Pano Retrograph is exactly what you're looking for. Moreover, Ulysse Sardin's Sonata series can be set to go off at a certain time or it can be set in a 24-hour countdown format. The Glossuta is more precise, but the UN can be used as a countdown. Oh, right. Bump a bump. I see Andrew ST12 saying, I tried the new JLC Reverso Tribute Moon and I absolutely love it. That is a cool piece. That was probably the coolest piece they came out with in 2017. All right, onward and upward. We're getting to the luxury divers, but let's start with a watch first before it's beating, because I want you to see the Breguet 7027. I've had a 7027 on the show recently. I wanted to show you this one in white gold, because it's a completely different aesthetic. Now, this family came out in 2005, updating the classic Breguet look and giving the brand basically an identity for the 21st century, separate from the pocket watches, the Marine, and the Type 20s. So this is the 7027, that seminal 2005 reference, taking the look of an Abraham Louis Breguet pocket watch and transposing it into a 38 millimeter white gold case. Here you can see the caliber 507DR. There is a case back power reserve mechanism that actually shows you the underlying wheels and works with a separate scale. And then there is a dial side power reserve for the 50 to 55 hour power reserve with a needle index right next to a rose lathe cut solid gold and silvered guilloche main dial. Mainspring barrel at center and it powers the drivetrain from the great wheel to the third wheel, the fourth wheel, the escape wheel, and then if we can get super close, an aerodynamic style recessed bolt free sprung balance. This is where it takes on a high tech look. You have a Breguet over coil hairspring because of course, and this unique blue spring known as parachute. This is a system based on what Abraham Louis Breguet himself invented for pocket watches. It is an oversized shock protection spring for the balance staff. So now I'm gonna have to invert this so I can wind it guys, but you're gonna watch this 5027 come to life. This is a supremely cool and undervalued watch in the marketplace right now. They sell for a fraction of their new retail value. Everyone agrees that they look the business. And I'll be honest, this is probably the most distinctive and original modern Breguet you can buy short of a grand complication. Word to the wise paddock, hacking seconds. All right. I absolutely love that little white gold 7027 BB. How about those frosted bridges and plates? Absolutely gorgeous. Okay, now Amro is asking, where is the AP Royal Oak Offshore Diver? I'll show you where it is. It's right here. One of the sensations of SIHH 2015, the diver upgraded to 15710. The primary change, a few dial details, but the primary change from its predecessor, the 
15703 being the addition of the display case back. Now you can see the Audemars Piguet, we'll get as close as we can, automatic manufacturer caliber 3120, because these divers do not have a modular complication like the offshore chronographs, they are much thinner. 14 millimeters in profile is only 1.4 millimeters thicker than a sub. Believe it or not, this watch can fit underneath a dress cuff. 42 millimeters as ever. If you're gonna wear it on a smaller wrist like mine, you want the slim profile of the diver and you want it on this diver strap. You can see it's a beautiful pebble grained cut style rather than injection molded natural latex strap. So you can get those fine details like the bevel of the hairline shoulder that continues seamlessly from the hairline flank of the case. That can only be done with a cut strap that's then hand finished, AP overlooking no details. Another feature that I happen to enjoy on these is the internal ratcheting bezel. So you line up the index with the minute hand and now you've got a count up chronograph from zero to 60 minutes. I find this is easier to read than a mechanical chronograph because let's be honest guys, comparing a mechanical chronograph like this Rolex Daytona, and we'll come back to the Daytona in a minute, but it's almost impossible to read chronograph minutes on an actual chronograph, and most chronographs only give you 30 minutes anyway. For timing most real world events that really matter, at a glance legibility and none of the downstream service costs of a chronograph with a dive bezel, it is the way to go. Automatic winding, 60 hour power reserve. This is a gorgeous watch and one of my favorite modern APs. You might not know because I, I'm not too open about it, but I'm actually a big AP fanboy. I love Chagere Le Coult and up to about 2000, they were almost the same company as AP for about a quarter century owned 40% of Chagere Le Coult, which is why there was a lot of commonality in movements across the two brands. Okay, the poster boy, literally the poster boy on the thumbnail that you just clicked and a true competitor to the Audemars Piguet. Similar in price, similar in size, similar in image, but very different in detail and history. The Blancpain 50 Fathoms 5015D. Why D? Well, D gives you that sensational rose lathe guilloche metallic blue dial. It gives you the blue sapphire capped bezel and not a flat sapphire like you'll see old, on older IWC Aquatimers or Bremont. Supermarine, no, this is a cambered sapphire, the expensive kind, and that bubble sapphire over the center dial has a little bit of the off-axis profiling and distortion of a vintage plexi. Now, of course, the 50 Fathoms is an old and glorious name, dating back to 1953, Bob Malubier of the Nageur de Combat asking Jean-Jacques Victor of Blancpain to develop a dive watch for the French military. And something very much like this, albeit a little bit smaller and manual winding was the result. Now 50 fathoms, nowhere near the 1000 foot rating of this modern timepiece, but Bob Maloubier would have recognized his progeny. This timepiece is effectively the legitimate long-term rival, not to the AP diver, but to the Rolex Submariner, beating it to market by a few months in 1953. Now, another series of features that makes this one a little unusual and also makes it the D rather than the standard 5015 is the satin finish of the case. And for a lot of folks, this is the only way they can wear the 45 millimeter 5015. In high polish, it's a bit glam rock, and I'll admit it. Whereas in satin finish, even with that dial, the watch is a bit more muted. Now, the vast majority of people who order this watch order it on the sailcloth strap because this, the legendary, X71 bracelet is objectively very expensive. It's about a $3,500 accessory by itself, but look at why this thing is touted on Fora across the internet. Beautifully made, alternately polished on its flanks, satin on its top, and you can see the interlocking male-female links are seamless. There are no gaps in the profile. You look at how a conventional bracelet is put together. For example, this Rolex Oyster bracelet, this is a 92908 on an older GMT. There are gaps between the links. The links don't interlock. Whereas on the X71, it is absolutely seamless between the links, with the result that the small intermediate links both close those ugly gaps and make the bracelet as supple as silk. It has the physical toughness of a Rolex Oyster, but the silky feel on the wrist of a President or a Jubilee. And on the underside, you can see large gaps. It can vent the wrist too. The spring-loaded leaf spring system that's used for closure snaps it shut like a Richard mule, 
But then, unlike a reshard meal, it also has a trigger that you have to manually depress to open the clasp, so you get two degrees of security with the leaf spring closure and the trigger. You'll also note the solid case back, anti-magnetic. This is an anti-magnetic cage around a Blancpain, three mainspring barrel, automatic winding, 1315 five day movement. That's right, five day movement in an era when we're just starting to get used to the idea of Rolex dive watches with 70 hour power reserves. Blancpain gives you 120. Three mainspring barrels artisanally finished, the ultimate in integrity. I have seen the inside of both of these models, and I can tell you that the Blancpain is better finished internally than the Audemars Piguet that's only made a few miles away in the same Valley de Jeu. The important thing to remember is these two denizens of Les Brassus do represent the best of their type. Oversized, rugged, finely finished. I'm going to give the edge to the Blancpain because it has the history, it has the color, it has the character. It is far more sophisticated technically. And frankly, I just can't get over that sapphire capped bezel. Definitely check out my review of this watch in a day or so. The loom shot, because of the entirely luminescent bezel, is worth your while. Okay. Guys, bump, 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 bump. Let me know. JPO Surf saying love, love, loves the 50 Fathoms on a bracelet. You and me both. I would buy it on the bracelet even though I would wear it on the sailcloth because buying it with the bracelet is a hell of a lot cheaper than buying the bracelet separately. The bracelet by itself costs as much as this Grand Seiko. Not quite close. The bracelet's about $3,500 on the Blancpain. This is about $4,400 on our website, but if you want value and you want quality, you don't need to go to Les Brassus. From Japan, Grand Seiko gives you handmade watchmaking, a movement assembled by a watchmaker, regulated by a watchmaker in six positions. A chronometer is generally five positions. This is six. Now, it has an El Primero-like high beat movement. I may as well wind it up so you can see what I'm saying. It's horrible to just show you a static watch. I feel like I'm showing you a specimen pinned to a board full of formaldehyde. It's downright morbid. But let me show you what this thing looks like when it's up and running. Okay, Grand Seiko 9S86 caliber, GMT dual time zone, 10 beats per second. This is a watch that could pretty much do it all. 100 meters water resistant, stainless steel, 39.5 millimeters. I'm going to show you this one on the wrist because, frankly, you're probably all wondering what the heck this is. If you don't know my watch collection, and I mean like my back catalog watch collection, you may not have seen this watch, but I got it for my 33rd birthday from my mom. This is my Swatch system. System 51, System Frog, one guess why it's called that. And this is the star of our show. All right. 39.5 millimeters, stainless steel, water resistant to 100 meters, date, second time zone, and a dial featuring hand finished and diamond polished, faceted Dauphine hands, a gorgeous kiln fired heat blued steel 24 hour index, and faceted indices themselves that are as finely finished as anything hailing from Geneva and the Rolex manufacturer. This is a lot of watch for the money, and for good measure, it comes with a full deployant clasp, not the pin buckle you might expect in this price range. As you can see on my 16 centimeter wrist, it wears well. This is a watch for just about anyone, from a 13 centimeter wrist right up to 17 and a half, 18. This is gonna look good in the process. So you might wonder, what does a 45 millimeter full bracelet 50 look like on my wrist? I can see right here, uh, pilot style saying that would be a big watch for Carlos, his wrist Carlos on our, on our chat. And Carlos T saying, I love the watch, but I've never tried one on. Not sure of the lug to lug measurements. Well, I can give you the lug to lug measurements of this Blancpain, because I measured it today. Okay. Lug to lug, the watch is about 51 millimeters, and if you include the end links of the bracelet, it's about 55.5, which means if you put it on a strap, you should have no trouble wearing it on a wrist as small as 14 and a half centimeters, and that's, that's impressive for a 45 millimeter watch. It's relatively thick, 15.6, 45 millimeter diameter, but it's critical to remember that at about 51 millimeters lug to lug, I'm wearing it on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, and I feel like I could wear this comfortably, happily, and without any kind of self-conscious nagging. This just looks good and it feels good. And I'm pretty happy about the fit right here. I could easily wear this on a smaller wrist. And I'm gonna show you the AP too, because the AP is big. Now the AP is bigger on my wrist. 
It still wears well, but it's important to note that if you were to measure these double links on the AP case flank, they're called plots, these intermediate links, you get a burly 58 millimeter measurement across the wrist. If you measure just the case, you get 54 millimeters. So it's pretty close if you just measure the case to the blanc palm with the solid end links of the bracelet. With the plots, it's got a broad stance. I wouldn't wear this one on a smallish wrist of about 14 to 15 centimeters. I think 15 and up, you can wear this one just fine. But you could see my wrist, 16 centimeters. And remember, the case itself is 54 lug to lug, 58 if you include the metal plots. So, Carlos, that's the sizing. Bum, bum, bum. Okay, Amro asking, wither the Amvox? That's a great question. It's right here. Okay, last time we had a little bit of Amvox action. You guys have seen the DBS in steel. I'm going to show you the DBS as most folks know it. It was the 2007 follow-up to the 2006 vertical trigger pusherless chronograph system that JLC debuted in the Amvox 2. Now this came out the next year, 99 pieces in titanium. This one had an open center dial and if you look at the base of the dial, there's this little set of semicircles rotating. That's the constant seconds indicator. It has a little Aston Martin wing logo on it because the watch is Aston Martin inspired. But that's what the Amvox 2 did not have that the DBS does. There's always something moving on the dial of the Amvox 2 DBS. Now it also has a cutaway center dial with twin sapphire discs for the chronograph hours and minutes. Now you, you reset this one, all of the action comes from pressing the case. There is no pusher system, and the idea is that if you're wearing racing gloves, you can easily manipulate this chronograph, whereas, let's be frank, the classical motorsports chronograph, the Daytona, just isn't set up for easy use with fat-fingered gloved hands. This makes a heck of a lot of sense, and in titanium, this 44 wears easy. I own the Amvox 2, the original in titanium, and it is a dream on the wrist. Very comfortable, because not only is it light, and not only is it less than 50 millimeters lug to lug, but you can see how the case back is curved. That lets it get a better planted stance on the wrist for operating the chronograph, but it also helps the watch to objectively wear more easily. Now, a couple of features I love about this watch are the open center dial, the pusherless chronograph system, and the slider mechanism on the side. You slide it all the way up and now you can't accidentally start the chronograph. You slide it all the way down and now you can start the chronograph, but you can't accidentally reset it. So you can't reset it while it's moving. You can stop it, but you can't accidentally damage it in the heat of battle. You set to the middle position and now you have the ability to start, stop, and reset. Also important to note with this watch, 65 hour power reserve, vertical clutch, column wheel chronograph, and you can actually see the chronograph hammers inside the dial, pivoting on their ball bearings at six o'clock. It is a very cool machine. And I should give you a wrist chat. One feature people love about this DBS, and it does seem to be more popular than the original Amphox, is the fact that you can actually see into the movement. And before the JLC Polaris collection came out this year, this was the only time you were able to see a JLC 750 series chronograph caliber in a JLC watch. Uh, you'll also note that the watch has a wonderfully oversized domed and box section sapphire. I find that with the toughness of the grade 5 titanium and the fact that the sapphire blocks almost every knock to the case, these Amvox 2 watches never scratch. They're just that tough. It's, it's just a great combination of a hard titanium case and a sapphire that blocks almost all the knocks. Also, how often do you see this? A watch with almost no bezel. Truly special. One of my favorites all time from a brand I adore. And the DBS has a much burlier, more contemporary and substantial strap than the original Amvox 2. Okay. A JBO asking, Tim, give us a loom shot. I can do that. If you go to my Instagram page right now, Tim underscore Masa on Instagram, first of all, follow me. Second, you'll be able to see a couple of loom shots that I've taken recently of 50 Fathoms watches, including the legendary X Fathoms and, of course, the standard 5015. Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. Moving on, uh, we have some questions. Uh, do you have a Portuguese perpetual calendar? Yes, I do. I do, as a matter of fact, and it's the 5033. So let me show you how this works, because this is a little bit crazy. The IWC perpetual calendar module was designed by IWC veteran watchmaker Kurt Klaus. It first came out in 1985. So you have one point of adjustment, which is the crown. And you have a bunch of mechanically programmed and coordinated sub-registers to the point where, 
me just make sure the watch isn't set to today so I don't accidentally set it days ahead. Okay, we've got a little bit of slack to work with. You adjust one indication and the rest move in sync. Let me see if I found the, there it is. See how everything moves? The, the day moves, the date moves, the month moves, even the moon phase moves as you adjust the calendar system. So you never have to look up a moon phase chart. You never have to make sure that you haven't invented a combination of days. It is mechanically programmed so you can set this as easily as a Rolex day just. Just set the correct day for the month you're in. Even the year and the decade will move in sync. Now, many will say that the highlight of this watch is actually the case back. Automatic winding, an enormous 36 plus millimeter automatic, seven day power reserve, twin mainspring barrels, Breguet over coil hairspring on a free sprung index. This is the caliber 52610, all manufactured and sized and shaped to fit the case. That is the sign of a true all in one manufacturer and IWC is now that. So you get all of that refinement and just in case you missed it, the seven day power reserve scale is concentric to the radial date. So all of that's packed into a dial that's big but balanced with a gorgeous cruciform symmetry, if you can forgive the year. Now I'm gonna throw this 44 on my wrist because you may wonder, how does a 44 millimeter watch wear, especially in rose gold on a smaller wrist? Well, first of all, the Portuguese has always been oversized. From 1939, it was the original oversized watch, so this is the look. It wears well, it is comfortable. It's 52 millimeters lug to lug, and I find it's a nicely curved 52 lug to lug. So there's no issue wearing this on a normal sized wrist. I would say wear this down to 14 and a half centimeters. You're not gonna regret buying it if you do. This one has a lug lovely Santoni strap, so you can see a bit of a striated flow of light and dark colors. You can see that the creases between the scales have actually been dyed darker than the scales themselves with a gorgeous gloss finish and a contrasting orange stitch. Turn it over and you can see the signature signal orange of Santoni of Italy, which is the manufacturer of choice for the most premium of contemporary IWC straps. And just in case you might have forgotten, Santoni signs each one. These are buttery smooth right out of the box. Wonderful pieces, wonderful watch. Let me show you one feature that you shouldn't overlook. The Peloton winding system, Paul and wheel, now fully in ceramic, unlubricated, solving the age old dirt on the movement problem that goes back to 1950 in the first Peloton systems. This one kills that dead while adding durability and a stark imposing case back visage. You can more easily point it out to your friends now and it's more durable. Plus, the watch now beats at four hertz. They finally stepped up from the original 18,000 to the original caliber 5,000 back in 2000. Y2K, we saw the first version of this thing beaten like a pocket watch. Today, it's finally 28.8. All right, bump a bump. Uh, Amvox watches have a Tony Stark feel, says Carlos T. And rightly so, as he wore the Amvox 3 Torbion in the Iron Man movies. Uh, question is, would Elon Musk, the real Tony Stark, wear one? I don't know, he strikes me as more of a super quartz kind of guy. I don't know why. Spring drive, maybe. Okay, I can see Matt Foster saying he loves his Amvox too, and I can understand that. I can also see AC4 asking, Tim, I saw your vid on the Reverso Sun Moon. Is this a rare bird? I've been trying to find one and no luck. Yeah, that is. It had a relatively narrow production run uh, from, I want to say, about 1998, 1999 to about 2004, 2005, and there was a low take rate. That was not a widely produced watch. If you find one, hang on to it in any of the metals in which it was made. A very special piece. Yeah, Edward Ludden of Sweden saying the Amvox 2, which is the chronograph, and the Amvox 3, which is the Torbion GMT, are his favorites. We have an Amvox 3, one of the 300 made in ceramic and rose gold. And Moro asking, did you ever feature a Mont Blanc with the full 360 degree earth globe? No, I have yet to feature that particular Villaray Mont Blanc. But if it shows up from the Minerva works, trust me, it'll be here first. Okay. Carlos saying, that is another watch I wish I had the wrist to wear. I think he's talking about the Amvox. All right, now, Amro asking, Tim, where is the Breguet Classique chronograph? He is clearly reading the description. Thank you. It takes me a while to write that. It's mostly for SEO, but I'm glad you're paying attention. Okay, Breguet, 2008 to 2012, this watch was made. But Breguet, 
5247 rose gold. So the BR5247 rose gold. Grand Faux enamel dial. Do I have your attention? Gorgeous Nautilus style telemeter scale, Breguet numerals. Beautiful. You can see the shallow concave recesses for the sub registers. All of the hands here are steel and kiln fired to blue. Gorgeous, oversized, counterweighted red chronograph seconds hand. 40 millimeter case. Those of you with a slight wrist, are you listening? 40 millimeters, 47 millimeters lug to lug. Nice and slim, classic in profile, and that's not even the best part. A movement that's found its way into high-end chronographs from the greats. Breguet, Patek Philippe, Vacheron Constantin, Roger Dubuis during the classical era of Sogem Roger Dubuis. This one here is Breguet caliber 5333. They hot rod it in some respects. First, they add a free sprung index. So you have a free sprung balance. They add an overcoil hairspring because it's a Breguet, obviously. Beautifully hand finished. This one also features a higher beat rate of 21,600 rather than the original 18,000. Breguet does make some changes, but the important details are the ones that inspire the expression, God is in the details, and truly that is the case. You can see the lateral clutch, the column wheel, the levers, and the horns of the chronograph system interacting. The reason you want a manual wind lateral clutch chronograph, even though it's old fashioned, is because it's also beautiful. And you can even see the recentering hammers acting on the heart cams at center when you reset the chronograph mechanism. Beautiful, and beautiful enough to want to wear it upside down. Even the spokes of the wheels of the chronograph clutch have been chamfered and beveled down with rounded profiles. You get what you're paying for with Breguet. They are some of the best pre-owned buys on the market. Effectively, metier d'art with the Grand Faux enamel dial and a movement that's found its way into the Holy Trinity as well as in Omega 321 form, the moon. This is a lot of history, heritage, and craft art in a 40 millimeter rose gold case. Absolutely beautiful. And a lot of color. I like that. I like color on watches. Okay. Bum ba bum. That I, 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 got a gr I got a great line in here from Steve Bowden. An, a wonderful Star Wars reference. That's no rotor. That's a space station. In reference to the winding mass that's inside the Portuguese perpetual calendar. That, that is a enormous 37 millimeter wide winding mass. And yes, it is the death star of bi-directional winders. I think I've hit almost all of my faves on the table tonight, but I am missing one that represents possibly the best value of the evening. Now, we haven't priced this one yet, but I'm not thinking much more than $3,500 when all's said and done. This is the semi-legendary Omega Speedmaster D8. This is the reference 3250-53, 39 millimeters, powered by an Omega Caliber 1151 based on a 7750. It has a radial date, it has a day, it has a month, it has a 24 hour dial, it has a real tritium patina dial because this one was made in the late 90s. This is what Panerai wished its fake patina dials looked like. E-Crew gorgeously faded, and even, even the hands match. The hands are also faded tritium. Tritium with a half-life of about 12.6 years from the late 90s is dead today. What you get is this gorgeous E-Crew fade, almost like saddle leather. On this dial, you have gray, you have black, you have white, you have blue, you have red, and you have that beautiful tritium patina. This is a lot of 39 millimeter automatic winding Speedmaster, and if you're burned out on moon watches, this is the antidote. A wonderful piece, and because I would want to see it on the wrist, I'm going to show you. 39 mil. Speedmaster Date 8. With 24-hour dial and a month thrown in for good measure. Lots of color, lots of character. If you want a Speedmaster, but you don't love the clone culture of the Moonwatch world, this is the one for you. Although I will admit it's not my favorite moon watch, it's not a moon watch at all. It's not even my favorite Speedmaster on the table tonight. Do you know what is? This is a unicorn. That's rare. This is 
magic. This is a five leaf clover. Are you ready for the Omega Speedmaster Professional Moonwatch Moon Phase Aventurine Dial? That's right, Aventurine Glass, scattered with flakes of copper. This came out at Basel World 2010. Rarely seen, it features a partially hand-finished Omega Caliber 1866, a distant relative of the Breguet 533 you just saw. 18 joules, manual wind, 21.6 beat rate, all of the fun is on this side. Where you have a crescent moon phase with a radial date indicator, it is a Speedmaster professional moon watch, and it says so because it has the moon watch caliber inside it. Sapphire crystal, ceramic bezel, 100 meters water resistant, and beautiful enough to make me want to shed a tear. That blue aventuring dial is magic, and because it is difficult to achieve, it's the main reason why this watch sold for $11,500 new. That's almost Daytona territory. What does it sell for pre-owned? About $6,500. If I'm buying an Omega off the table tonight, it's probably this one and I would have to think long and hard before choosing this over any other chronograph on the table or even the 50 Fathoms. That's how special this moon watch, moon phase of Venturine is. Gorgeous on both sides, but this one has an extra gear. And on that note, I leave you. I love you, but I leave you. And check the description below to click the link and win a watch. We're finally giving away something that you can wear on your wrist, a Breitling Colt Sky Racer. Make it yours. Thanks so much for joining in. I'm Tim, there are the crew. This is Watchbox Reviews, which is filmed at Watchbox Studios. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.